Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Melissa Stagnaro. I'm the Executive Director of the Shenango Memorial Hospital Foundation and Director of Fundraising and Business Development here at UHS Shenango Memorial Hospital. It's an honor to moderate today's session. We are very excited to continue our lunchtime learning series with a special presentation on gout and pseudogout by Dr. Rachel Ludo of UHS Rheumatology in Vestal. Now, when Dr. Ludo and I first discussed our topic today, all I could think of were historical figures who famously suffered from gout, like Benjamin Franklin, Galileo, Leonardo da Vinci, Thomas Jefferson, Theodore Roosevelt, the list goes on. But Dr. Ludo, Ludo quickly set me straight. This is a medical condition that modern day rheumatologists like herself see on a regular basis. Thankfully, both treatment and diagnosis have advanced significantly since Jefferson's or even Roosevelt's day. She described gout to me as common yet complex, which is a description that can apply to many of the rheumatic conditions we've discussed in this series. The rheumatologists who presented also share something in common. I asked each of, those, each of them why they've chosen this particular specialty, and each gave me much the same answer because it's both challenging and rewarding. Dr. Ludo, for Dr. Ludo, it's about helping people solve their long-term health problems and live their best lives. Doing so isn't always easy because most rheumatic diseases are diagnosed clinically, meaning there's not one single test that can prove a particular diagnosis. As Dr. Ludo told me, rheumatologists are often asked for a consultation when no one can come up with a unifying diagnosis. She said it is incredibly rewarding to realize that she earned a skill set that allows her to help patients whom other doctors cannot. I know one of Dr. Ludo's patients personally, and I can tell you that her passion for her specialty and her dedication to improving the lives of those in her care truly shines through. Whether you're here with us today because gout or pseudogout touches your life in some way, or to increase your personal or professional knowledge, welcome. We invite you to ask questions, and if you feel comfortable, please feel free to share your personal experience with us. We'd love to hear your stories. You can do so at any time in the presentation via the chat or by, using, or by raising your hand, and we'll also allow time at the end for questions and comments. Dr. Ludo, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Melissa, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it is my pleasure and my honor today to be presenting uh, the special topic on gut and pseudogout. So um, my interest in this topic ultimately stems from, you know, the immune mechanisms leading to gout and pseudogout, which involves activation of pathways that are quite complex. And one of them is actually called the inflammasome. And it's exactly what it sounds like, inflammation. So gout and pseudogout are both among the leading causes of inflammatory arthritis, um, along with PMR, polymyalgia rheumatica, which my colleague, Dr. Puaskar had uh, did an excellent overview on a couple of weeks ago. Um, and like Melissa mentioned, you know, gout has been known since antiquity, even as early as the 13th century. However, you know, despite important advances in our understanding and treating gout in particular, it still remains a disease that is often suboptimally managed um, and therefore has the potential to result in severe joint damage. Um, and it is through education uh, for our patients, uh, their caregivers and primary care providers um, that I base my talk today. So uh, we can move on to the next slide. So a US veteran with gout once said, I've been shot, beaten, stabbed and thrown out of a helicopter, but none of that compared to gout. So, I mean, that, that really sums it up. Next slide. So what is gout? So gout is an inflammatory condition of the joints and surrounding tissues, and this includes the bone, uh, the cartilage, and soft tissue areas, and is caused by too much uric acid buildup in your body. So uric acid, it's a natural substance that, um, that's in our blood, okay, and where does it come from? It's actually the end product of breakdown of something called purines, which we ultimately get from foods um, such as meat and meat products, but other foods as well, which I'm going to get into. And when these excessive um, levels uh, of uric acid build up, it can, it can build up in the joint and, and form what we call monos monosodium urate crystals. You may um, hear me refer to this as MSU crystals. 
And it's the crystallization um, of excessive levels of uric acid that causes gout ultimately. So I'd like to point out that gout is an inflammatory condition. It's uh, meaning it's not uh, truly autoimmune. Um, it doesn't view, involve immune mechanisms, but like pseudo gout, actually, these conditions do, do not involve specific autoimmune antibodies. So we don't really call it an autoimmune disease. It's the most common inflammatory arthritis um, in the US. The prevalence is about 4%. And um, interestingly, high uric acid levels are, are necessary, but it's not a sufficient risk factor in gout development. In fact, we see a lot of patients here um, in rheumatology with high uric acid levels without ever having a history of gout. Um, however, their risk does increase as the levels get higher. And usually this is like greater than nine or 10. And we'll talk about you know, the, the golden numbers later. But um, just some background, the kidneys filter uric acid. Um, so a concentration of greater than about 6.8 in the blood um, does increase your risk of gout substantially. Um, but if the levels get too high or if the kidneys can't remove it, um, uric crystals can form and settle into a joint. Okay, so moving on. So just a little bit of background, okay? How is the term gout derived? So the term gout is actually derived from the Latin word gutta. I think I'm pronouncing that right. And it translates to uh, as a drop. So back in the 13th century, it was thought that gout resulted from a drop of evil humor affecting a vulnerable joint. And this explains why a majority of early gout therapies were aimed at removing excess humor um, with the use of bloodletting and cupping, for example. This is like ancient times. Um, so gout has been known, you know, since uh, for a very long time. And in fact, historically, it was referred to as um, the king of diseases and the disease of kings or um, a rich man's disease. OK, and this is because. Um, this was due to excessive indulgences and passions, including like alcohol and red meats, which only uh, could be afforded by the rich, you know, during that era. Um, so I, I really like uh, art history. This is actually a uh, picture from 1799 from an artist called James Gilray. Um, and it's called The Gout. And it depicts the pain of, of the artist's gout. And it, it depicts as a demon. So I found that quite interesting. Moving on. So who gets gout? So uh, gout affects men more than women. Uh, in fact, gout is rare in men less than 25 years old and in premenopausal women um, who are usually protected from gout, except in cases of underlying disease, you know, such as strong genetic uh, factors, um, such as inherited defects um, in their ability to break down purines, okay? Uh, excessive alcohol use or kidney disease. Uh, but uric acid levels rise after puberty, both in men and in women, particularly after menopause. So fun fact is that gout is actually rare in most other animals um, due to their ability to produce this enzyme called uricase. Um, and this, this enzyme is needed to break down uric acid, but humans and apes actually do not have this enzyme. And therefore gout's, gout is, is common in, in humans and, and apes, in fact. So um, high uric acid and gout are strongly associated with um, this metabolic syndrome. This includes risk factors like uh, hypertension, diabetes, um, peripheral vascular disease, uh, as well as high cholesterol, um, high triglycerides. In fact, it, it's been estimated that the prevalence of gout um, has increased by almost 50% in the last few decades in the US. And, this is partly related to the rising rates of obesity and metabolic syndrome in our population. So we can move on to the next step. Slide, thank you. Uh, so what is responsible for high uric acid level? So I'd like to kind of break it down. Um, there are a set of patients called overproducers, okay? Um, and this, we can actually get this from our diet, overproduction of gout. So excess purine consumption, those purines again, where, do, where are we getting it from? We're getting it from shellfish, organ meats, particularly liver, and high fructose corn syrup beverages, including soda, concentrated fruit juices, um, and particularly alcohol. Uh, so beer actually has a, a twofold uh, risk over liquor. And actually moderate, contrary to popular belief, moderate wine consumption does not appear to increase uric acid in the blood or gout risk. 
but I still, you know, tell my patients everything in moderation, but beer um, has the highest risk factor among the alcoholic beverages. So there are conditions that lead to increased cell turnover that can lead to elevated uric acid level. And these are things like leukemia, lymphoma, psoriasis, um, hemolytic anemia, which is um, a destruction of blood cells and polycythemia vera. So some of you may have heard of these, um, these diseases. So in addition, the, the deposition of uric acid crystals in, in the tubing systems of the kidneys can also lead to kidney failure. And this is usually following treatment for lymphoma or leukemia, for example. And alternatively, about 10% of patients with gout have genetic abnormalities causing excessive uh, uric acid production. These uh, diseases include things like Lesch 9 syndrome, glucose 6-phosphate deficiencies, which, um, you know, these patients are lacking a particular enzyme, which um, does not allow them to um, get rid of uric acid. Um, so it does build up in the blood. And these, these diseases are diagnosed quite early in life. Next slide, please. So some risk factors. There's also people that can't get rid of uric acid level, uh, uric acid in the body, and these are called under excretors. Most patients are under excretors rather than over producers of uric acid. Um, the most common risk factor for high uric acid is, is under excretion by the kidneys. Um, people with kidney disease, there's also people um, that take particular drugs. Um, low dose aspirin is a, is a particular risk, but it can help protect against things like heart attacks and strokes. So we don't usually recommend that people with gout stop taking low dose aspirin. Also, um, you may have heard of things like water pills, these diuretics, um, medications like hydrochlorothiazide as well as furosemide, also known as Lasix, can increase um, uric acid in the blood. And there are immunosuppressants in people who are uh, for example, organ transplant recipients, they take things like cyclosporine tecrolimus, um, which lowers excretion of uric acid. Um, there are uh, metabolic diseases, including hyperparathyroidism, as well as hypothyroidism, that um, result in under excretion of uric acid, and as well as lead toxicity, which can be, it's, it's associated with kidney disease, and that's how it increases risk of gout. Um, Many people have a combination of both processes. They're over producers as well as they're under excretors. Okay, but for the most part, most people are, are under excretors. Um, and although not really routinely done in clinical practice, we can actually measure who's an over producer and who's an under excretor um, by urine studies. So I just want to mention that there are certain events that may trigger an, an attack of gout. And these include, you know, drugs, like I mentioned. Uh, interestingly, medications that actually decrease uric acid level, uh, uric acid levels in the blood, um, and as well as acute medical illnesses. A lot of my patients say they got a gout flare after, you know, a particular hospitalization for an infection, or, for example, or certain trauma to a joint that was particularly damaged in the past, um, um, radiation or chemotherapy, um, surgery, you know, events that also precipitate dehydration can certainly precipitate gout attacks um, and other, other stressors of the body. Next slide. So what are the symptoms of gout? So this usually involves sudden intense pain and swelling. It can involve either one joint or two joints or even more, but um, usually early gout flares typically involve one joint. This is about 85 to 90% of patients. It begins abruptly. The classic presentation is something that you may have heard of called podagra, in which it's the joint of the big toe. And this becomes painful, red and swollen, and it reaches usually maximal intensity in about 12 to 24 hours. Um, and this is involved in more than about 50% of most people's first flare of gout is this, this joint called podagra. So other commonly involved sites include joints of the mid and the hind foot, um, the knees, the wrists, the fingers and elbows. And it's, it, what's interesting is that joints that have undergone previous degenerative changes appear to provide like a local nidus that actually facilitates um, crystal formation. So some of my patients say, you know, I thought this was just a bad bunion, but then it started getting worse. But the thing is with bunions, you know, there's already degenerative disease at that particular joint. And so 
if you are at increased risk of gout, it can, it can affect the same joint. So um, gout attacks may start at night or actually in the early morning. And why does this happen? It's because during this time, the joints are more cool and crystals like to form in cool areas. So um, it tends to happen uh, in, you know, at night or early morning. And it can also involve a low grade fever, typically like less than 102 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and you know, after it resolves, you can also have peeling of the skin over the affected joints, um, which can occur with rather the resolution of inflammation. And then, you know, this can be followed by intermittent painful inflammatory attacks after the first event, um, which may start to involve other multiple joints or um, may even persist longer. Or on the contrary, it may not even come back for years. So not everyone who has a first joint, sorry, a first gout attack necessarily need therapy. Next slide. So I just want to briefly go over this. Um, there are stages of gout. So stage one, you, go, you know, you got high uric acid levels. So uric acid is building up in the blood. It starts to form crystals around joints. Okay. And you're not really feeling anything yet. Um, and then stage two, we call it acute gout. Acute means like sudden, you know, in uh, the past few weeks or months. So symptoms start to occur and then you get these painful gout attacks. And then stage three, we call it intercritical gout. So these are the periods of remission. You know, you're, you're not having symptoms, um, but you know, the risk is possibly there. And then stage four is tophaceous. So we call it tophaceous or advanced gout because tophi start to form in the joints. So tophi are like stone-like deposits and they're made up of monosodium monosodium urate crystals, these MSU crystals. And it's surrounded by this fibrous and inflammatory tissue. And they can form in any joint or any tissue um, and it can lead to a lot of damage, skin ulcerations, infections, disability, and frankly, like impaired quality of life. Um, and it's usually a consequence of ineffective therapy, okay, or under treatment, or, you know, some people are just not taking their medications properly or, they don't want to take medications. So patients with this degree of gout severity should be referred to a rheumatologist um, for further management. And you could see these examples of um, tophaceous deposits in the joints of the hands. And these can actually ulcerate if you could see where the number one is. It can ulcerate through the skin. Um, Tophi also like the, the ears um, because these places are cool. Remember how crystals like to form in cool places. Next slide. So there are mimickers of acute gout. So things that your doctor will think about are, your doctor, your primary provider will think about are things like infectious arthritis, um, especially if it's involving just one joint, uh, pseudo gout, which we will talk about shortly, which is a different type of crystal, not uric acid, but um, calcium pyrophosphate. Um, and then there's also some arth arthritis that are, is called, caused by basic calcium phosphate. Trauma to a joint can certainly present like gout. And then there's other forms of inflammatory arthritis as well, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, or acute rheumatic fever. Um, but those presentations are usually much different. Usually involves more, more joints in, in a symmetric um, or in a symmetric distribution. Next slide, please. So how do we diagnose gout? So the diagnosis is based on clinical symptoms, um, medical history, uh, including lifestyle, physical examination, and laboratory tests. So blood tests can actually measure uric acid, though high levels don't always mean gout. Like I mentioned before, some patients can have a gout attack with a falsely low uric acid level, actually, um, and, and vice versa. Some people can have elevated uric acid levels in the blood and never have gout, you know, so um, we have to take everything into consideration. The gold standard is actually joint aspiration. So this is where we take a needle and we use it to withdraw fluid from the swollen joint. And then um, it's sent for laboratory analysis and we measure the number of inflammatory cells. We look for specific crystals such as monosodium urate crystals or even calcium pyrophosphate crystals and pseudogout, for example. And then we also possibly send tests to exclude infection, right? Just to make sure there's no infection. Um, and, and 
We may possibly also order x-rays or other scans, such as do an ultrasound, which can look for evidence of gout in the joint, as well as a CT scan, maybe a dual energy CT. Um, so, you know, but usually it only shows changes, like x-rays, for example, which show changes in longstanding disease um, and severe gout. So as you can see on the, um, some diagrams here, the uric acid crystals, actually under the microscope, they look quite beautiful. They show up as yellow, actually. It depends on, we, we use uh, special lighting. So it shows up as yellow and it's needle shaped. And then at the bottom, um, we see uh, tophaceous deposits on this first, uh, the, the joint of the first big toe. Um, and over time, this can actually cause rat bite erosions where you can actually see these um, erosions of the bone and it looks like a rat took a chunk out of it. And you know, there's certain patterns that um, we look for in gout, which actually look much different than what we see in other inflammatory arthritis like rheumatoid um, arthritis or psoriatic arthritis, for example. Uh, next slide, please. So how is gout treated? So uh, the management centers on two fundamental principles and I spent a significant amount of time in the office educating my patient on just this um, at the time of diagnosis and even at follow-ups because it's so important to understand how it's properly managed. So first is control of inflammation. This is to treat or prevent acute gout attacks. And then secondly, there's another set of treatment that reduces uric acid levels. So they're two totally different treatments, but they kind of go hand in hand and both are essential for proper gout management. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide. So first I'm gonna talk about control of inflammation. You may hear your primary, uh, sorry, your, your, um, your doctor, your, your nurse practitioner talk to you about prophylaxis. So gout flare should be treated with medical um, medication intervention, ideally within 24 hours of onset to maximize um, treatment efficacy. So there's certain medications that we use. Um, one of the medications that are quite popular are colchicine, and this can ease a gout flare and help prevent attacks. It is an anti-inflammatory. Um, however, there's things that we have to consider, such as adjusting for kidney function, drug-drug interactions, and then side effects. Um, the most common side effect actually being GI side effects like diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea. Um, next, there are low dose non-steroidal anti-inflammatories um, that work very well. However, again, we have to take into consideration gastrointestinal and cardiac toxicity, especially, um, you know, it can cause acid reflux. Um, so a lot of our patients with metabolic syndrome may have heart disease and long-term non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are not safe. Uh, and then we use uh, oral steroids a lot, or even what's, what's best, and actually if one joint is effective, we can even do um, a local steroid injection, um, which can ease a gout flare. And this may be the safest treatment option for, for, for most flares. And my colleague, Dr. Quascar, did speak about the side effect of steroids uh, during his excellent overview on polymyalgia rheumatica a couple of weeks ago. Um, so, you know, we have to take the risks and the benefits into consideration. And then lastly, there are uh, these uh, agents um, which work on the level of the immune system called anakinimab, or um, but these are used off-label and it's used for severe cases when standard therapies are ineffective, contraindicated, or not tolerated, um, but they're quite expensive. All right, next slide. So just uh, then we have urate lowering therapy. Okay, so these medications decrease uric acid levels. And the ACR, um, the American College of Rheumatology, currently indicated that medications um, should be started, these type of medications should be started in patients uh, with gout who have had more than two attacks within a one year period, or one attack in uh, if they have uh, moderate chronic kidney disease, or one attack if they have um, TOFI or kidney stones present. So not everyone you know, meets criteria for treatment, for long-term treatment. And the goal of uric acid level, um, the target that we go for is less than six. 
Okay. Uh, so we use things like allopurinol, and this is one of the first line treatments for most rheumatologists, uh, rheumatology providers um, in the absence of any contraindications or side effects. And it blocks an enzyme called xanthine oxidase. And this is the enzyme that actually leads to uric acid production. So you can see why it works. And um, it's usually started at about 100 milligrams daily, sometimes lower, and increased appropriately to um, reach uh, a specific goal uric acid level. And I usually take the start low and go slow approach. We repeat the uric acid level every few weeks, and then you know we go up slowly. If you do not have a, if you have a side effect or you do not tolerate allopurinol, um, febuxostat, also called uroloric, is a newer drug, and it's usually used in uh, a certain population, um, and it also blocks uric acid. It's either equal or more efficacious, um, and actually causes less hypersensitivity. Some people have um, you know, allergic side effects to allopurinol, um, but it is more expensive, but it is well tolerated in patients with kidney disease, which allopurinol, you know, again, we have to take that into consideration. There are other medications that remove uric acid, but may increase the risk of kidney stones. Um, and so it has limited use in people with kidney disease, and that's probenicid and lanisterad. And then there is an infusion called picloticase, which can help break down uric acid levels, um, but it shouldn't be used in people who are overproducers. So again, you know, it's complex, but you know, if uh, you should talk to your, your uh, rheumatology provider um, on which treatment best suits you. I wanna mention that these, it is important to know that once you start these treatments, the uric lowering therapy treatments, they should not be taken on an as need basis. And this is one of the misconceptions that my patients have. They come in and they say, oh, you know, I had a gout attack. So I took the, my allopurinol for only three days and then I stopped. That's a no, no. Okay. Because what increases risk of gout flares are actually these shifts, these rapid shifts in uric acid in the blood can certainly increase your risk. They should be taken, you know, regularly and long-term. So important to note that. Next slide. So just some treatment considerations. Um, gout flares can be precipitated in with the initiation of urate lowering therapy, uric acid lowering therapy, like I mentioned. So therefore the anti-inflammatory therapy, right? The prophylaxis, as well as the urate lowering therapy, if it's indicated, it needs to be started either, it has to be started together or the prophylaxis has to be started in advanced, okay? Because the uric acid reduction can provoke attacks. So the prophylaxis actually helps prevent that, okay? And the prophylaxis is, is usually continued for at least three to six months. Um, after achieving either the goal uric acid level or once the TOFI resolve, uh, we consider discontinuation of the, the prophylactic treatment. Um, but some patients with recurrent gout flares may require continued prophylaxis for a longer period of time. Um, and it's important to note, again, that, that while initiation of the uric acid lowering therapy can precipitate gout flares, the therapy should neither be stopped nor reduced during a flare, okay? So it shouldn't be stopped um, when the flare is occurring. It should, you know, continue. Uh, and we can move on to the next slide. So very important is diet and lifestyle, which can help manage gout and prevent flares. So weight loss is recommended only if appropriate, okay? And it can improve high uric acid levels. And then given gout is often associated with high blood pressure, heart and kidney disease, your primary care provider or your rheumatologist may, may test for or watch for signs of these health problems and make sure they're, they're appropriately managed. Again, avoid excess alcohol, especially beer, which can trigger gout. Next slide. Thank you. So, some of my patients ask me, instead of taking medications, can my gout be controlled by diet alone? But unfortunately, gout is difficult to manage just by diet alone because the purine content typically contributes only little to the total uric acid uh, found in the blood, but it can certainly help. And so I recommend dietary 
modifications to all of my patients. So patients should limit or moderate uh, their consumption of purine rich foods. So we're going back to the red meats, particularly organ meats like liver, um, seafoods, particularly shellfish, sardines, and anchovies, um, excessive fructose consumption, okay, sodas, concentrated fruit juices, energy drinks. Like my husband loves energy drinks. Luckily he doesn't have gout, but energy drinks um, have purines in it. So in contrast to moderate intake of purine rich vegetables, such as uh, spinach, cauliflower, asparagus, and mushrooms, um, as well as nuts, legumes, like beans and peas, these are actually not associated with an increased risk of gout. So I say, although these vegetables are high in purines, continue taking them, they're good for you. Um, they, we have, there is substantial data that coffee intake through a non-caffeine mechanism does um, decrease risk of gout flares. Also vitamin C, low fat dairy, okay? So low fat milk and yogurt does help. And then tart cherries may lead to modest reductions in uric acid and lower gout risk. So um, this is a nice summary on the right side uh, about low purine diet for gout. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So our second topic is pseudo gout. So what is pseudo gout? So this is a lesser uh, known crystal arthritis. Okay, it's, but it is the third most common cause of inflammatory arthritis after gout and polymyelodramatica. So um, instead of monosodium urea crystals, this actually uh, involves calcium pyrophosphate crystals and it can cause symptoms actually similar to gout. Yet in calcium pyrophosphate disease, it's, um, it's the calcium pyrophosphate that triggers the reaction, okay? So it's known to induce inflammation through pathways that are similar to gout. And so, um, but it's not really treated the same way. So this is, it presents as painful inflammatory arthritis attacks, usually also reaching maximal intensity within 24 hours. And calcium pyrophosphate is actually a common cause of calcification near joints and in joints, but it's not always presents, it not always presents with symptoms and are actually found coincidentally on like just x-rays, for example, you know, and, and we see this a lot. Uh, typically the knee, the wrist and the shoulders are, are affected, but it can actually affect the intervertebral discs, even the, the cervical spine. Sometimes we see this in the neck and it can cause acute neck pain. Next slide. So um, what causes calcium pyrophosphate deposition? So this is actually caused by excessive body calcium or other metabolic abnormalities, even production, overproduction um, of byproducts by cartilage cells. Um, and that's like soft tissues around the joints. So uh, in most cases, it's not clear why the crystals form. Although crystal deposits clearly increase with age, we usually see this, the prevalence increases with age, most commonly in patients over 65 years old. And about 50% of patients greater than greater or equal to 85 years old actually have coincidental like findings of calcium pyrophosphate deposition in the joints. Um, risk factors include previous joint injury, genetic factors, um, as the condition has actually been found to run in families. And so genes likely play a role. Experts actually do not know how to prevent these, these crystals from forming. And there's actually currently no means or medications by which the crystals can be dissolved besides surgery. If um, calcium pyrophosphate deposition is due to some other medical problem, which we'll talk about, treatment of that condition may sometimes prevent it from getting worse. Next slide, please. So risk factors uh, uh, include um, associated diseases such as hemochromatosis, which actually involves excess iron storage. Also people with low magnesium levels in the blood can have increased risk of this disease, an overactive uh, parathyroid gland um, or an underactive thyroid gland. Um, and then there's also some cause of the excess calcium in the blood. But usually we look for this, particularly when um, pseudogout is found in a young person less than 55 years old. And some of the laboratory tests uh, we may order may surround uh, these diseases, depending on what we have suspicion for. Um, but I'd like to actually mention that hypothyroidism, having a low thyroid function does not actually cause calcium pyrophosphate deposition. 
it's the initiation of treatment for the hypothyroidism that like in a patient with CPPD that can actually precipitate a pseudogut attack, okay? So you just wanna make that clear. Next slide, please. So um, we're almost done here. I just want to show you uh, what I meant by cognitive calcinosis. As you can see here, uh, this is calcification um, that appears as a linear density within and an, uh, parallel to the surface of the cartilage. There's no specific treatment. And actually cross-sectional studies in the literature show that about 8% of the population can have chondrocalcinosis on the x-rays and not have any symptoms at all. Uh, next slide, please. So how is pseudogout diagnosed? Like, so unlike gout, podagra, you know, that first, the, the inflammation of the big, the joint of the big toe, that's actually uncommon in pseudogout. However, usually pseudogout is generally indistinguishable from a gout flare. So again, we get the synovial fluid. We aspirate the fluid from the joint to make a definitive diagnosis. Now I like to show you here that there is a difference underneath the microscope. And this is what we use to definitively diagnose um, gout versus pseudogout. So in gout, we have you know, the needle-shaped crystals, they're yellow in color, but in pseudogout, the calcium pyrophosphate crystals are actually rhomboid shaped. They're like these cub cubicle shaped and they actually show up as blue. So we can certainly make a differentiation. But I wanna mention that coexistence of the two diseases is possible. I have many patients with both. Um, so yeah, you can have both. Um, lastly, rheumatologists consider pseudogout in any patient with symptoms suggestive of seronegative rheumatoid arthritis or polymyalgia rheumatica, people who are testing negative for rheumatoid. Okay, we, we certainly um, consider gout. Okay, next slide. And I think this is our last slide. So how is it treated? Again, we use local treatments, joint aspiration to minimize the pressure in the joint, local steroid injections, especially if like one joint, it, one or two joints are affected, we use um, local steroid injections, joint immobilization, as well as ice packs. We do use systemic treatment, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, colchicine, and then oral steroids. Um, there is prophylaxis for recurrent attacks. We do use long-term low-dose colchicine or daily non steroidal anti-inflammatories. But again, we have to take into account, you know, excuse me, gastrointestinal as well as cardiac toxicity in, uh, with the use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Um, and the people that have chronic recurrent disease, we do use um, immunosuppressants and immunomodulatory agents, okay, such as methotrexate, hydroxychloroquine, as well as anakinra. You may have heard of this, but this is for people with severe recurrent attacks, treatment resistance disease. Um, Again, anakinra, not FDA approved. It can be very expensive. Unfortunately, there's no therapy to prevent deposition of calcium pyrophosphate um, or to remove the calcium pyrophosphate deposits that are already present. Unless, of course, you have like joint replacement. If you know, if there's degenerative joint disease affecting that joint, for example. But it's important to note that any underlying metabolic disorder um, that can contribute to pseudogout should also be addressed. So people with hyperparathyroidism, low magnesium levels, and, and of that sort. So um, we can move to the next slide. It's our last slide. So this is just a, a few resources um, that I'd like to provide for our patients and their caregivers. Um, here at UHS Rheumatology, we um, rely on clinical guidelines based um, on uh, you know, data from the American College of Rheumatology. I did um, add some fact sheets on gout and pseudogout, which is very like um, well understood and you know, very uh, simple and well presented. Also the Arthritis and National Research Foundation um, have a very good website uh, for patients. I do like creakyjoints.org. Um, they have really great diagrams. And then obviously the Gout Education Society, if you wanna you know, look for resources in the community. So that sums up my presentation. It was a lot, but I hope you learned um, a lot about gout and pseudogout. And I'm open to any questions. Dr. Ludo, thank you so much for this very informative presentation. Um, I know we do have a couple of questions already in the chat.
Okay. Um, the first one is, can you please tell me if CPPD can be aggravated by using glucosamine chondroitin to provide cartilage in the joints? So can it be, so from what, for the, the question is, can glucosamine and chondroitin sulfate um, increase risk for CPPD? Correct. No. Oh, well, at least there's no data on that, that it can. Um, a lot of patients of mine use glucosamine and hyaluronic um, acid supplements, um, especially if, the, if they have osteoarthritis. It has not been shown to precipitate pseudogout or lead to calcium pyrophosphate disease, as far as I, um, I know so far. Um, I'd like to mention that these medications um, need to be taken every day for like degenerative osteoarthritis, but they have to be taken for long periods of time. But there is some data that it works, but no. The answer to your question um, is that it does not. Okay. Uh, second question, uh, you mentioned gout originating genetically. Does that mean my father's gout could have been mine and when would that have likely originated? Yes, so there is, um, it's not all in all though. So there is a possibly a genetic predisposition um, for if you're, if you have a family member in, in the immediate family in particular that had gout, you can be at higher risk of gout, but, um, it may be secondary to some underlying disorder. Like I said, people with, um, metabolic syndrome or even underlying kidney disease that may have more of a genetic predisposition can increase, um, your risk of gout. Um, but not, this doesn't usually, this doesn't always run in families. Um, and certainly, you know, if you have any symptoms that are suggestive, possibly of gout, yeah, definitely talk to your, to your doctor, but there isn't a, um, genetic test, for example, that can tell us whether you have, you know, um, that we, we do on, you know, a, um, a standard basis that can tell us whether you're at increased risk of gout through a familial, um, risk. Okay. Do we have any other questions? Uh, if you do, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can use the chat. Dr. Ludo. Hi. Hi. Um, do the, is it the trophy, the trophies? What are the, like the little deposits? Those go away. Uh, yes, they can go away. Um, so it, it does need treatment though. So treatment is initiated and this is with urate lowering therapy. They can dissolve. It does take a long time. Um, but usually in people with, uh, tophaceous gout with tophi deposits, we're more aggressive actually with urate lowering therapy. And instead of our goal uric acid level in the blood being six, we actually go down to five because it does show that the lower the uric acid level is the, um, lower the risk of, of um, the monosodium urate crystals precipitating, you know, once it's, it's that low, but it does dissolve over time. It takes, it takes a while. Um, if it does, if you have significant tophaceous burden, um, some of my patients do seek uh, surgical intervention and they, it can also be removed, but they, they are meant to go away if you're treated adequately. Thank you. Medication. You're welcome. All right. Any other questions? All right. With no further questions, I'd like to say thank you once again to Dr. Ludo and her colleagues at UHS Rheumatology and to each of you for joining us today. We hope you'll join us for the next installment of this series, um, which will be on Tuesday, July 27th. Our topic will be osteoporosis and Nicole Osterhout, a certified nurse practitioner who is on with us today, will be presenting. To register, you can call 607-337-4183 or email me at Melissa dot stagnaro at nyuhs.org. Thanks again for joining us today and uh, have a wonderful day. Bye everyone. All right, just wanted to